live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. During this past offseason, the Atlanta Falcons traded longtime and probable Hall of Fame wide receiver Julio Jones to the Tennessee Titans. How the trade worked was how most trades work. The two sides talk about getting a deal done, the deal gets finalized, and then Julio takes a physical just to make sure everything is good. Once that happens, the trade becomes official. And for more than 99% of all trades, that's exactly how it works. Even if there could be a ton of drama associated with the trade, and that was definitely the case with Julio, the actual process of how the trade gets done is relatively straightforward. But imagine this crazy scenario. Imagine that while Julio was still on the Falcons, the Titans called up the Falcons and asked if Julio would come over and work out for them. Julio agrees to the workout for the Titans while still under contract with the Falcons, and a few days later, the trade gets finalized. Something like this seems ridiculous. Here you have a player under contract with one team, flying and traveling to another team to work out for them, just for the possibility that a trade could get done. You would think that something like this wouldn't be allowed, and just wouldn't be possible. However, back in 1986, that's exactly what happened. In 1986, the Cleveland Browns worked out Indianapolis Colts quarterback Mike Pagel while Pagel was still a member of the Colts. And this is the story behind the strangest trade in Indianapolis Colts history. Before I talk about the trade in question, as well as what made it so bizarre, we need some context as to the player getting traded. In 1982, the Colts, then located in Baltimore, were under the guidance of a brand new head coach, as they acquired longtime Arizona State head coach Frank Cush. Cush didn't want anything to do with quarterback Burt Jones, and wanted his own guy there. With that, he drafted Art Sleister in the first round, and he was supposed to be the quarterback of the future. Obviously, that did not work out, as he might have become the biggest bust in the history of the NFL draft. However, one rookie quarterback wasn't enough. Baltimore wanted two, and in the fourth round, the team drafted Mike Pagel out of Arizona State. Now, Pagel and Cush knew each other from their two years together in college, and now Pagel was being brought in as the backup to Sleister. However, it didn't quite work out that way. Thanks to a whole myriad of issues, Sleister rarely, if ever, started under center for the team. And for four years, Mike Pagel was the primary starting quarterback of the Colts. It was sort of analogous to what happened in the 2012 NFL Draft, when Washington drafted Robert Griffin III in the first round, but Kirk Cousins, drafted in the fourth round, wanted to start a ton of games for them instead, and would even outlast RG3. Now, those situations weren't identical, and one of the big differences is that while Kirk Cousins was a solid quarterback, Mike Pagel was not. In his four seasons under center, he never finished the season above 500 as a starter, and never had a season where he threw more touchdowns than interceptions. As a rookie, he started all nine games during the strike shortened season, and the Colts failed to win a single one of them. Pagel routinely ranked near the bottom of the NFL amongst starting quarterbacks. In 1982, of every quarterback to start at least eight games, he had the second worst passer rating. In 1983, of every quarterback to start at least 15 games, he had the second worst passer rating. And in 1985, among every quarterback to start at least 14 games, he had the worst passer rating. During the mid-80s, it was commonplace for the Hoosier Dome to become a house of booze, as the honeymoon period of Indiana getting an NFL team wore off really quickly once the fans became subjected to Pagel playing under center. After a disastrous 1985 season where the team went 5-11 and, and finished with the third fewest passing yards and fourth fewest passing touchdowns in the league, it was very clear that Mike Pagel was not the answer at the position. Now it was time to find a replacement. The Colts decided going into 1986 that they needed an entirely different quarterback room. Signing Blair Keel wasn't going to be enough. They needed some drastic changes. With that, they made two critical moves to ensure that the days of having to see Mike Pagel command the offense were done. The first move they made was to trade with the Dallas Cowboys and acquire Gary Hogaboom. Hogaboom had been with the Cowboys since 1980, serving as the backup of Danny White. However, Hogaboom had his ups and downs. In 1984, he started 10 games in place of White and threw just 7 touchdowns and 14 interceptions. He threw a touchdown on just 1.9% of his pass attempts. Among the 28 qualified quarterbacks in the league that year, that was the worst percentage of them all. After he was demoted to third-string quarterback in favor of Steve Pallor, he demanded a trade and got his wish when the Colts came calling. The second move they made was to find a quarterback in the NFL Draft. Initially, they had their eyes set on Purdue quarterback Jim Everett and went as far as trading up to the number 4 spot in the draft with the New Orleans Saints just so that they could have a better chance of getting him, completely failing to take into account that one of the three teams in front of them could take Everett instead. And sure enough, Everett was drafted by the Houston Oilers one spot ahead of the Colts, destroying that ill-advised plan and resulting in not just the Colts missing out on their franchise quarterback, 
but resulting in the Saints, with the extra pick received by the Colts for doing nothing, receiving arguably their greatest defensive player in franchise history in Pat Swilling. I talked at length about that debacle in a previous video of mine, so if you want to learn more about how that all played out, then click the card in the upper right corner. When that failed, they settled on a different Big Ten quarterback, taking Illinois signal caller Jack Trudeau. Sure, Trudeau was no Everett, but he still put up some good numbers in a tough conference against some tough competition. He led the Big Ten in completions, yards, and completion percentage during the 1983 season, and in 1985, finished inside of the top 10 in the entire NCAA in all three of those categories. In fact, when he graduated, he was second all-time in Big Ten history in completion percentage, only behind Iowa quarterback Chuck Long, who was also drafted in 1986. Either way, the Colts had Hogaboom and Trudeau. Mike Pagel's tenure was mercifully over. Now, it was time for the Colts to try and offload him somehow. And this is where things get incredibly bizarre. Back in 1986, free agency was not the same as it is today. How the system worked was like this. Suppose a player was a free agent. If another team wanted to sign the free agent, they could, but they would need to provide the original team with compensation of some kind. And Mike Pagel was one of those players who was technically a free agent, even though regardless of what happened, he would have had to sign a contract with the Indianapolis Colts. It was a really weird system, and was a far cry from what we have today with unrestricted free agency, where it really is the Wild West out there. It also didn't help that the Colts were a highly dysfunctional organization where no one was on the same page. In the Everett video, I talked about how owner Robert Ursay and head coach Rod Dauhauer were on completely different pages with wanting to make that trade. Ursay was all on board, while Dauhauer was adamantly against it, and didn't want to give up any draft picks. Well, the same thing happened here with Pagel, where the organization was torn with what to do with him. Dauhauer wanted to get rid of him. He saw him as the starting quarterback in 1985, and quite frankly, that was all he needed to see of him to know that he wasn't very good. Dauhauer flat out said that Pagel would be somewhere else when the 1986 season began, and that Hogaboom and Trudeau would get the bulk of the work. Pagel was not in the team's plans. However, Ursay thought differently, saying that he thought that the chances are good that Pagel would remain with the team. Ursay loved Pagel, saying that he had tons of experience, and criticizing reporters who thought that the team should get rid of him. As Ursay said, Everybody's put words in my mouth and thoughts in my mind that Pagel's through with the team. He's not through. Despite Ursay and Dauhauer being on completely different pages, Pagel clearly wanted out. If he was technically a free agent, and the coach had no intention of having him in the game plan, then what was the point of being there? The only problem was that even though he wasn't really under contract, he kinda was, as the Colts still held his rights, and as mentioned before, any move to another team would require compensation to come Indianapolis' way. That's when he decided to schedule a workout with another team. The team in question? The Cleveland Browns. Jim Steiner was Mike Pagel's agent, and he was the mastermind behind the plan. How it would work was simple. The Colts' front office and Pagel's team would be in contact with other teams and ask if any of them would be interested in a workout. Then the workout would happen, and hopefully from that point on, if a team was impressed, they'd sign Pagel, with compensation coming in these way. Oddly enough, even though Robert Ursay was completely against the idea, General Manager Jim Ursay was completely on board. As he said, we're all going to try and work together. I'm hopeful it will benefit both sides. It's a situation where we're not hiding any cards. I think we're talking straightforward to each other. So just to recap where we are right now, we have a head coach who wants the player to go as quickly as possible, a player who wants to get out of Indianapolis as quickly as possible, and a front office determined to get Pagel out of India as quickly as possible. The only thing standing in the way is the owner, who seems to be the lone person not on board with the idea of getting something out of a bad third-string quarterback. With that, Pagel, while his rights were owned by the Colts, was able to organize a workout with the Cleveland Browns. The Browns had quite a few quarterbacks on their roster at this point, including Bernie Kosar, Gary Danielson, and Paul McDonald, but they wanted to see what Pagel had. And fortunately for all sides, Pagel impressed the team. As head coach Marty Schottenheimer said, We were impressed with Mike when we worked him out. We feel he can come in here and compete. When you stockpile talent, you improve your team. And with that, the trade was executed with Cleveland sending the Colts a 7th round pick in the 1987 NFL Draft, and the Colts sending the Browns Mike Pagel, who was a Colt, but technically wasn't a Colt, but technically was a Brown for a day, even though he was still a Colt in a roundabout way. Yeah, everything about this was just bizarre. But whatever the case, Pagel was gone, and Coach Dauhauer said that hopefully, the change of scenery would be good for him. So that raises one final question. How the heck did this entire situation work out for both sides? Let's start with Pagel who actually lasted a surprisingly long time in the NFL considering his awful start. He played five seasons in Cleveland backing up Bernie Kosar, and was a fairly solid backup all things considered. In 1988, he was asked to fill in for four games, and as a starting quarterback, went 2-2, two and two, 
which played a big part in keeping Cleveland's season afloat as they made it to the postseason. He even played in the wildcard game against the Houston Oilers that year and threw two touchdown passes while completing 68% of his passes. The Browns lost that game thanks to one of the worst calls in the history of the wildcard round, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. However, Pagel played in the NFL until 1993. When a fourth-round pick carves out a career lasting over a decade, he's doing something right. As for the Colts, it wasn't often that Robert Ursay turned out to be the smartest man in the room. This was one of those rare Blue Moon instances where that was the case. Three weeks into the 1986 season, Hogaboon was out for the year after separating his shoulder, and Trudeau had to leave his first start with a left knee strain. This meant that Blair Keel was now under center, even though six days before the game, he was in Canada trying out for a CFL team. Now he was getting significant reps in an actual NFL game, which turned out to be a 24-7 loss to the Los Angeles Rams. And to make matters even funnier, because the Browns played on Thursday night and the players had Sunday off, in the stands of the Hoosier Dome that day, sitting alongside the fans, was none other than Mike Pagel. The draft pick conveyed to a ninth rounder, becoming linebacker Bob Onko, who played a grand total of three games, but at that point the Colts were just trying to get anything for Pagel's services. When you consider everything that happened here, this might be the strangest trade in Colts history. You had a player who was technically still a Colt go and work out with another team, with the Colts granting him permission to do so, even though the owner was completely against the move. And then, that quarterback comes back to Indianapolis as a fan, when all the fans around him are probably thinking that they wish they still had Pagel. Everything about this was just bizarre, and showed just how crazy the free agency rules were back then with regards to who could get compensation, who could move around, and what team owned what player's rights. Mike Pagel didn't exactly have a memorable career in Indy, but nearly four decades later, his departure, considering the circumstances behind it, was certainly something to remember. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jaguar9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters who help the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.